Hello, Kim Holstein. Welcome to the podcast. It's so great to be here, Kathy. Thanks for having me. Oh, I'm so delighted uh, you're here. And full disclosure, Kim is a friend and a neighbor, but super talented woman and inspiring in so many ways. So I can't wait to have our conversation. Thank you. I'm really excited to be here and you are an inspiration. I've loved following you and seeing all the amazing things you're doing. So it's really great to be here. Oh, thank you. All right. Well, Kim, why don't you tell our listeners a bit about your very interesting background? And first, of course, you're like a mom of three, right? And you have two of them in college. So one is out of college, one's in college, one's going to college in the fall. So it's a lot of transition, but yes, three, two boys and a girl, and it's been a great ride, <laughs> lots of twists and turns. And so yeah, that's my, my family, my journey. Wow. Where do I even begin? I guess I'm going to start. I'm originally from Texas and after graduating from University of Texas, I moved to Chicago. I went to Northwestern. I had a dream to be in advertising and I had some vision that it would be like this creative experience, mixing business and the inspiration of ads and putting together with through film and creativity. I don't know. I had this vision, but let me just say that after my program, which was creative and interesting, I got in the real world of advertising and I realized that I perhaps had taken a wrong turn and I felt really paralyzed and I felt stuck in quicksand. Like I couldn't move. I couldn't get out of those positions in advertising, but it wasn't feeding my soul. And um, so I struggled for a long time. And I read an article about a woman who was making these pretzels in a farmer's market, soft pretzels. And you know, how you read like a little something like a blurb and it's like, it could be three lines or, you know, very short, but it just got my attention. And I started dreaming about these soft pretzels and all these different flavors and chocolate chip pretzels is really my big obsession. It was around the time there were all those bagel shops with different flavors. And I was dreaming about these soft pretzels and the different flavors. So anyway, I think that in my misery of advertising, the pretzels gave me a lot of hope and a lot of I could sit in meetings and just dream about how they might come to life and the flavors and taste and the uh, recipes. And I mean, it, it was wild. So I struggled with that, but I worked on it. The first pretzels were awful. So just, you were dreaming about these pretzels and then you were like, Hey, I'm going to sell pretzels. Is like, I'm, like, how did you reach that jump? I thought I have nothing to lose. And I felt like, let's, let's see what happens to this. I actually found out there's a women's business development center in Chicago. And I started taking some classes there and the first pretzels were horrible. I mean, it really, they were awful. I have some friends that we still laugh today as like, they were so bad. They were unedible. So I struggled and it was truly a couple of years before I met Scott, who's my husband. Now I met him at a bookstore in Chicago it was a personal growth bookstore called Transitions. I was just going to say Transitions. I know that bookstore. It's closed. Yeah. <laughs> we went to a book signing, both of us separately with some friends. And it was Richard Bach who wrote Jonathan Livingston Siegel. And Scott was there with his friends. I was there with my friends. And we connected. And it's kind of funny because we were at the book signing. And then I went to Whole Foods next door. And he came over with his friend, a friend of his. And he brought me a juice shot. <laughs> And it's so funny now because, you know, I'm talking about pretzels, but then later now we're in juice and it kind of took us full circle, but I was reflecting on how he brought me this juice shot. And I was like, that's so funny. It was a green juice shot. Oh my God. At that point he was feeling pretty lost and I was lost. And so we eventually started our pretzel company. And I guess this is a long way to tell you that this was my journey to find my passion as an entrepreneur. So I was in advertising and I so we started the pretzel company and I did both for two years. So it was advertising in the day, pretzels at night. And then it was 1997, May. I, you know, wrote this letter and it was my resignation. And I let them know that I was leaving to do full time in the pretzels. And that really set me off on a whole new journey. Was that scary to leave the full time? Oh. It was so scary. I can just remember the feeling. It, I mean, it took me two years to do that. 
But it was so funny because my parents, they were in Europe at the time. And my dad kept telling me all the time, keep your day job, keep the health insurance. (laughs) You know, he was always like this conservative approach. And they went on this trip to Europe. And I seized the moment because I felt like I'm never going to do this until they're gone. And I told him later, I said, you know, the risk of not doing it became bigger than the risk of staying, you know, the risk of not seeing what would happen if we really jumped into this vision Mm. and had faith. And so it was a powerful, like a portal. It It was so powerful. It's like that. And a nin quote, you know, the risk of yes. staying, you know, tight. Tight in the bud. Right. Having the courage to take the risk and like blossoming, right? And I, I really felt that. And I'll never forget when I walked into my boss's office, I gave him this letter. It was surreal. I mean, I, I just felt like I had this huge circle of support. You could just feel the energy of like cheering of, yes, just you know, jump into this, see what happens. What's the worst thing that can happen? And that is, yeah, that is so amazing. You followed that sounds like intuition and just, even though it was scary and you followed that in your joy, is that fair to say? Oh, so much. It led me to a path of just such an incredible journey. And not that it wasn't, I mean, definitely challenges and it continues on challenge or failure, fear and all of that, but it's so real and authentic and it's mine. And I think that that changed my life. And it's amazing. Um, so you created this business, it's Kim and Scott's pretzels or was that the Kim and Scott's gourmet pretzels? Yeah. And how long did you run it for? And how did that evolve? You eventually sold the company. Is that correct? We did. So we had it for 17 years Wow! and we really started with a credit card and we were in our studio apartment and um, making the pretzels. We found incredible helpers and teachers and people who were so generous in guiding us. And neither of us were bakers. It really started with this enthusiasm and um, I loved the salty, sweet combination of a, a chocolate chip pretzel. And we just dove in, I mean, truthfully. So there's so many different chapters to the journey of 17 years, but I think there were some pivotal moments where we started selling at a, a trade show and that's where Barnes and Noble found us. And then we sold on QVC and that's where we started to sell direct to consumer. And then we've gotten Whole Foods and we started selling at Sam's Club. And so we started to build it you know, it was just one step at a time. And we had incredible people who worked with us. I mean, the ladies who they hand twisted every pretzel and it was just, I can taste them to this day. I, I remember being in like in Utah and seeing it in you know this little grocery store. And I was like, oh my gosh, it's so cool. It was amazing. It was just an incredible journey and a love for all the different people who were on the journey with us. And um, my daughter, we were talking about last night and she was talking about how we would have a pretzel spinner and have that at Halloween when people would stop by, we'd have hot pretzels. It was just really a big part of our life. And we had a pretzel twisting cafe where the kids would come and twist pretzels. And it was so fun and fulfilling. And I feel like it taught me so much about myself, the whole journey And it was in 2012, 17 years later that we sold. And why did you decide to sell? And I would say that was one of the most difficult decisions for me. No one talks about the grief of of, of letting go of a company. Mm -hmm. Um, They talk a lot about this financial experience, but no one talked about the, the loss of all the things that make it such a magical journey. And I think for me... I was not excited about selling. We had a lot of advisors that had pushed us towards a sale. They felt like we had built to a certain level that we either had to bring in funding or sell. And there was a opportunity with our largest competitor and having three kids that were going to be in college. I had to just give in and trust. And, um, 
but I would say that it was one of the most difficult, painful decisions. Mm. And I definitely had such grief. I just, you know, especially mm. that month, the weeks before and the weeks after I was just like crying all the time. Oh, so we don't talk about grief in general in our culture. Right. <laughs> right. So that's the first thing, let alone, you know, a business, but it's like, that was part of your identity. And you birthed it, right? It's, it was your baby. You created it from nothing. So it makes it was sense. Really, yeah. And I just, you know, I had really loved all the people that worked with us, um, all the ladies in the bakery and all the shows that we attended. I mean, there's just a culture and a community that I felt a lot of passion around, but I'm thinking about it. You know, it's so interesting when we can sit with grief and feel the loss and feel and, and move through that and be open to what's on the other side. I feel like it gave me the past 10 years of a lot of personal growth that led to deeper joy. And I think about your podcast and joyful purpose. And I feel like in that joy is grief too. Like, can we move through it? Can we sit with it and feel the loss and then be open? Wow. What, what is next for me? And so yeah, that's something yeah. I've been working on for a long time. So cool. Cause I mean, that's the truth, right? When we don't stuff our emotions in any way and we allow them to move through us, they teach us and we get through it so much quicker or in a healthier way, opposed to like pretending it's not there. Right. And I think that's been powerful to sit in the uncomfortable unknown and feel whatever's coming up around it. I mean, it's so scary to move through such a transition and then be like, what's next? Mm. What am I doing with my life? Right. I mean, well, especially I find like so many like busy professional working women, moms, like we want the plan. (laughs) We want the plan. We want it organized. We want the to do thing all set. Yet when it comes to so much of life and creativity, right? It's it's like also like allowing it just to be whatever it is and allowing for that inspiration. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. And that requires patience to allow it to unfold. And it's not really in a time that can always be, it, it's not like, oh, wow, I know that in these, in three months that I'll be here. I, there was just a lot of unknowns. I had to start, I had to surrender to the timing and sit in the unknown. And it was uncomfortable. It was difficult. And um, it was a huge bridge. I I really felt like it was this bridge to a new chapter and it took, it was a long bridge. (laughs) What helps you sit in the uncomfortable? Well, one incredible gift I feel is the circles of women in my life circles. And, um, that's been so powerful. I, mm-hmm. I did this women's weekend when I was 25 called woman within, and I was in a women's circle for 17 years. And then that circle, it ended for different reasons. And then I was able to join another circle of from woman within. And I also have these just wonderful circles. I'm in this other circle of women from around the area of our neighborhood and call it soul circle. And I just find that the support of women on the journey, facing transition, hearing and witnessing each other, being our most authentic selves, that support is. Yeah. So oh, I, I couldn't agree with you more. That's why, it, right? that's why I run women's groups because I feel like it's so powerful and there's such wisdom in, you know, the group itself from amazing women. So, yeah, it's life changing the work you're doing and the groups you're leading and all the, I mean, you are an inspiration and oh well, you are just as much of an inspiration to me. So right well, back I, at you. No, so, yeah. That's just been a huge force for me. And I think has helped me to sit in the unknown and perhaps just not know where I'm going. <laughs> and yes. then suddenly certain things started to happen, new doors opened. And I felt, wow, like, wow, this is, this is interesting, you know? So with your current company, how did that evolve? Well, between the pretzels and the juice, we had 
the Crave Bar, which was a right. ice cream pretzel product that um, Scott actually had created. And when we sold the company, we kept the Crave Bar. And I had this crazy idea to have an ice cream truck, the Crave truck. And I wanted to go to all the festivals and, and take the ice cream truck. And I just, I thought that would be so fun to have this mobile vehicle for selling versus being limited to the frozen aisle. And so we did that. It was a time when the kids could get involved. I mean, all the kids, whether I, I could just remember they would go on deliveries with me or Aiden, my youngest, he was on the truck selling a lot of times. He did some different festivals. There were some great moments in the Crave Bar and there were challenging moments. And I, I just felt ice cream is the most difficult product. I mean, I remember there was a heat wave and our freezers, all the, the power went out and the ice cream melted. And I think that is a great example of how it was like a delicate process. And then COVID hit. And I mean, there was not an event to be happening, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, so anyway, Crave Bar took a different path. And there's an entrepreneurial couple in Evanston that took on all our equipment during COVID and they're selling the Crave Bars. And we had a shift to juice, which is Twisted Alchemy. And um, that started, actually, Scott uh, was a bartender in Paris and he had squeezed tons of limes at this bar and never, ever wanted to squeeze a lime again. And our birthdays are in May. And often we would celebrate with margaritas and he would be on the search for the best lime juice and he would buy it from restaurants. And with our business background and food and beverage, you know, and food and knowing about HPP technology, he had this idea to use HPP, which is pressure technology and bottle hand squeeze lime juice and save bartenders from squeezing the juice. And so that's where it started as industry juice. And, and then it, it grew into a whole juice line of like of pomegranate juice and watermelon and blood orange and pineapple and grapefruit. And these are all fruits where it's like 24 lemons in a bottle, 30 limes in a bottle, um, 22 blood oranges. So it's all fruit in a bottle squeezed and then using HPP. So there's no heat and cool. yeah, it's twisted alchemy. So very cool. Um, we'll put the company information in the show notes so people can check it out. That is so cool. It's been interesting to, you know, move through the grief and be in the unknown. And then it was surprising that we're landing in this new journey. Um, it's somewhat new. We've been in it for a while, but it has, it's different, but it has a lot of layers of fulfillment and exciting energy and meaning, purpose, joy. It's challenging, but it's been really exciting to be in another path that fills me. Exciting. So what has helped you most with the creativity piece of all the different businesses you have created and run? So creativity is... It's one of my greatest passions. I love to seek out teachers of creativity, find out different exercises and tools, how to tap into our creativity. I like to daydream and, and have like blank space where I can just allow inspiration to come to me. I like to play. I think that creativity comes in play where it might be crayons or markers. I don't know. I always tend to go with like the art supplies. That's always a fun tool for kids. You're just, yes, artist way. I mean, I taught the artist way several times and I just love the book and that's so what cool. she talks about play. Yeah. And then we're all artists, you know? Right. So I think that that's just, it's exciting to tap into our creativity through some different exercises. And so I like all of that. I mean, it might be, you know, I, I seek out teachers everywhere that help me to tap into my creativity. And I love to work with other people who might be looking for a solution or looking for a new path. How do we find the creativity to bring that to life? Mm, love it. Is there any particular exercises that you like to do that helps spark your creativity? One of my favorite things to do, well, 
First of all, before bed, I find to be a really powerful time where I might at the end, you know, right before bed, you know, going to sleep to do a short little list of things I'm grateful for in the day, kind of move through that. I I find rituals that bring balance. And then I have something, I call it the divine download. It's like a one pager, blank page, quiet, no music, and just let whatever comes to me, write things down. And I don't know, just ideas just pour down, has to be quiet. You like that before bed or in the morning or both? I love it before bed. Okay. It's like the timing for me that I find to be really inspiring. And then one of my teachers, Sonia Shook, that's a teacher that I really love to follow. And she- I love her. I've taken lots of her classes. I think I told you, I saw you once at a seminar years ago. You (laughs) So cool. Well, you know, um, she always says this line, if I weren't afraid, I would. Yes, it's such a great line. It's just always stuck with me. So sometimes I'll write that at the very top and I'll go through, you know, I'll put on my calendar, Every day I go through waves where I'm I'm like, let's do that exercise. What comes up? What am I, what am I not doing? Because I'm not even conscious that I'm afraid, you know, what's holding me back. I love it. It's such a powerful question. I forgot that exercise. It's so good. Thank you for the reminder, but yes. Right. If I weren't afraid, I would. And then just stream of consciousness, right? Absolutely. It's wild. What comes up. I mean, it's just a basic question. So those are a couple of my favorite tools. Yeah. I just, you know, having intentions too. I think that it's one thing to have some dreams that I want to want to bring to life. And it's another thing I can say, oh, I want to, you know, do this, but I feel like having the intentions and like actually mapping it out. I like to call that a manifesting map where there is actual deadlines and dates and details. Like getting into the mechanics of what is it you want to bring to life and how um, are you, are you thinking just, Oh, I want to do that, but you're not really thinking about the pieces that go. It's like making a dinner, you know, spectacular dinner. There's like the recipes and there are all the steps and it's complex, right? Yes. It's the recipe to create. Right. It's the footwork. You're right. It's like, you can have the big dreams, which are fantastic, but then breaking it down to manageable steps to actually see it happen. Right. I love it. So you're a dream doula. Can you tell us about that? Well, dream doula, it's just something that's called to me for a long time. I, with my, with my kids, I had a doula every time who helped me to, you know, helped us through the birthing process. And also when the babies came home, the doula helped me as I, you know, learning to be a new mom at each step of the way. And it was so nourishing and powerful. And I felt in the past years, especially in these 10 years, since we sold the company, I kept having this name of dream doula come to me where when I think about this, I have this passion for helping people birth their dreams and it's all I can feel it. It's all as if someone is sharing, I wish to do this, or I want to, they, they have dreams. I can't help but feel like, yes, can I help you? Can I hold you, you know, in the yeah. same way that the birth doula helped me birth my children, let's birth these ideas. And that's my passion time. I realize even with companies, it's that birthing and the creating versus down the road when it's like, bigger and you're managing something much larger. I realized that my joy and my purpose is in that birthing process and creating. I love it. And helping others. I I mean, I feel very similar with helping others create, you know, what they really love and what they really want, not just going through the motions. So feel you on that. Yeah. Well, and the truth is, is that it's unlimited, right? So there's unlimited opportunities to create and Mm -hmm. we need each other for that. There's unlimited teachers that we need to guide us. I seek that out myself and um, that inspiration and guidance. And then I love to help other people as well. And I see that, I mean, in your work and your retreats and, and everything that you're doing, it's like, how can we help others along 
through transitions and to birth new beginnings. Yes. You know, I don't think we dream enough, especially if we're so busy, right? Busy, busy, busy. If you're juggling many things, just allowing yourself the time and space or getting help to dream is so powerful so that you live more intentionally about what you really want in your life. Absolutely. Yeah. So um, what would you say about confidence and imposter syndrome? What are your thoughts on that topic? Where do I even begin? I think that it's something I'm always working on. I found that Woman Within, that weekend that I did when I was 25, was instrumental in helping me to connect with women of all ages, especially some of the older women who could be mirrors for what is a confident woman, right? What is stepping in the power of us, the truth? I like to call it the alchemy of you, like your truest self. Like how do we harness that energy and really be in our truth? Because I see it as like a stepping into, am I going to be courageous? Am I going to be brave to be my fullest self, to follow my true path? And I think that that confidence is a very deep level. And so I would say that I think that sometimes there's scary moments and moments where I'm not connected to my confidence. And it's just another opportunity to step into it and say, I know that empowered woman that I am is here and I'm going to take, to step into that. So, Mm. and, you know, you mentioned imposter syndrome, and I think that's something that perhaps all of us as humans might deal with, but I'm learning to, I can hear that voice and I can say, no, you know what? I've dealt with you long enough. No, my work is to really be my truest self, Mm. own my truth and and step into that alchemy. And if I'm going to do that, the imposter syndrome, that part of me, I have to put it aside and just say, not now I've done that. I'm really done with that. So today Mm -hmm. that's how I'm feeling about it. I'm not going to say that I'm sure it pipes up sometimes, especially when I'm challenged, when I'm challenged with something scary, something that I'm not really in my comfort zone, but I am learning that there's a voice inside that says, step aside, I'm here and I'm I'm going to do this. Kind of like what I said earlier, the risk of not stepping into my, my pretzel company, the pain of not stepping into our power is just so debilitating. It's just like shrinking. You know, I think about that Marianne Williamson quote, there's something such a loss when we shrink and we don't really be the force we are. A thousand percent. I mean, the quote is, you know, who are you not to shine, right? Who are you not to be fully you? I'm paraphrasing it, but that's the truth. So what helps you be your most authentic self? Because So often in our culture, especially with social media, with just pressure from how things should be versus, you know, how we truly are is sometimes they're not aligned. (laughs) Right. It can really fill you. It can fill you and distract you. There's a book I love. You just reminded me when you said that it's called The Crossroads of Should and Must. It's one of my Mm. favorite books. I think about that a lot because the world might tell us what we should be. And that book, it's like a great tool to to tap into what we must. Oh, and um, so I find that that helps keep me in alignment. And listen, we all get distracted. I think that social media, it can be an empowering source or it can be a distracting source. So I try to be very selective in what kind of media I use in my time is so precious. So I'm going to be selective. I'm going to miss a lot of things, right? I can't be on it all the time and I don't want to be. It's so noisy. So I think that being selective helps me to be focused and how to elevate my myself, elevate my energy and my intentions and stay on course. That empowers me. 
Love it. Yeah. Because social media, I mean, what we feed in our brains is the diet too, right? It's right. It's, you know, really powerful what you allow yourself to hear and see every day because that affects your mood and energy. Absolutely. And, you know, it really is a muscle to be flexed. It's like, you know, we'll go work out and and do that workout, but it's like, there's the workout for your well-being and kind of your whole essence of who you are and working that muscle, working the, the belief in yourself and staying true with, you know, my purpose, my focus, how I want to spend my time. I mean, we have to be intentional or we really do get off track. And I think for me, that's, and I have to start the day off like that. If I don't, I definitely feel that distraction and, you know, not feeling grounded. Yes. Yes. I totally agree. Like not immediately going to your phone or social media, really connecting to yourself first in the morning is such a powerful practice. What are your thoughts on failure? I'm sure you have. Oh, yeah. I have so uh, lots of thoughts about failure because on our journey with our pretzel company, especially, I think I learned to fail and I learned to fail and move through it and actually be curious versus judgmental and so afraid. And there's so many gifts. So failure, when I can be courageous to allow, you know, get, get, get messy I think that's really, it's like, we can't do everything all just perfect, get messy, allow yourself to get in there. Like we fail all the time. We fail. I mean, I fail in a lot of different areas and I have to be willing to say, okay, well, I'm going to move this or shift this. And then also feeling like I fail as a parent. I think that comes up a lot. I'm just going to say, I mean, Sometimes I'm like, these kids, they don't come with manuals. And I'm like, what am I doing? But I actually connect with a feeling of forgiveness and compassion and really forgiving myself. I'm human. I'm not going to do it all just right. And then compassion. We're on a messy journey. And so I think those tools I tap into most. I love it. You're not alone in feeling like... (laughs) A failure as a parent as time. I think we all do, right? It's like, oh my gosh, when your kid isn't doing X or Y, you feel like it's your fault. And the truth is, it's not your fault, nor is it your credit (laughs) if they're doing X or Y. That's so true. That's so true. And I think we can get distracted by comparing with other people. Oh, well, wow, they did ABC and they're there. And it's like this whole external process. And so I think it's, It's also important to like stop that, catch that and come inside and say, my journey is unique. I'm going to screw things up and I'm going to just do the best I can and then tap into forgiveness, compassion and shift, not harp on things. Um, Yes. I mean, that was my very first mini podcast episode, the key to achieving any goal is to have compassion for yourself (laughs) because you mess up, you screw up, you fail. And if you go into that self-criticism constantly, it just keeps you stuck. Right. A great lesson for the kids also that they can see us um, struggling in the mess of things that we, you know, can, we can fail, we can fumble, And that we find our way and we learn, we learn so much from it. So true. What you talk a lot about energy and feeling energy and my hunch is you follow energy. So what tools help you with tapping into raising your energy and or feeling energy about anything or anyone? Sure. Well, I find that the more that I'm connected to myself, I'm really sensitive to energy. I'm sensitive to places where I am with people that, you know, if I might be somewhere and I'm getting a sense, oh, I want to leave (laughs) or wow, this is amazing energy. And I really want to stay, you know, just being attuned to the energy that surrounds me is really powerful. 
I find um, energy to be such a source. It's a source of fuel, right? It, I mean, to feel energized, that is what helps us to thrive and to really flourish. And without it, I, the contrast is so significant to me. Mm-hmm. So, well, first of all, I'm very sensitive to the energy I'm around and I'll find myself somewhere and I'm feeling a heavy sense I need to leave, or it's just not feeling right. Like, I think it's so important. Tune into yourself, check in with yourself. How are you feeling? Is this feeling right? Is And it's nothing personal to anyone, but I listen to myself when I'm sensing a no, maybe I even have plans and then I'm getting a sense, oh, I'm not up for that plan. I've realized that saying yes to some plan out of obligation gives no one any benefit if energetically I'm feeling like, wow, I'm getting a no. I'm feeling that I made that plan and now I need more space uh, for my day or I don't know, just respecting myself more and how I use my time and not thinking so much how it might affect other people, but actually knowing that they're going to appreciate that more because energetically I'm not able to be there. So that's, I I love that by the way, like just how you said that saying yes to something that you don't want to do benefits. No one. That is a brilliant quote. Yeah. And then it helps me to be more attuned when I find myself really clear when something is a yes, then I'm so much more present Mm -hmm. and I have so much more fun. So I've really found the power of the energy that I'm around. And I also find that nourishing myself in a quiet space or whether maybe it's a walk outside, like alone time fuels my energy Mm -hmm. and making sure I have enough alone time. And when I don't do that, I can feel depleted. You know, everyone's so different, but um, I know for myself, I really need to have some structure to taking care of myself, being out in nature, so grounding. And how do I nourish my like body, mind, spirit, all of it, right? What am I eating? How am I physically, you know, working out and also like breathing, meditation, yoga, all of these different ways that we take care of ourselves add up to energy. And I just, so I love it. (laughs) That's so awesome. What are your thoughts or tips with work-life balance? Well, I think COVID was a gift for me. We had our offices down at the Merchandise Mart before COVID and Uh, you know, the drive down, the drive back, trying to get back for the kids, all the hustle and bustle. Life was so full. And since then we moved our office home every week. I noticed that I, even on Mondays, I'm just, I'm so excited because I have this new, like new space that's still new. I'm saying that after all this time, but I just, I can start my day and create it with some structure and balance. But I believe that with work-life balance. And I don't know who said it, but we can have it all, but not all at the same time. And that always resonates in such a true way, because I think as moms, you know, we've had these different chapters and different ages of our kids. Now my kids, I have only one at home and space opens up. And um, so I'm seeing this opportunity for a lot more balance and working to be intentional, how I use that time. But when the kids were little, I mean, it was just, you know, all the balls is how to juggle everything at once. And then my last comment about that is to get help. I am passionate about support and whether it's your circle or whether it's someone that helps you for a couple hours with an assistant or someone in your home helping in some way, we are not here to have to just juggle every single ball. And so thank you. That is so good. One of the best tips I got, you know, having children and working full-time as a lawyer and everything is like hire as much help as you can afford. Yeah. And it's, you feel even guilty doing that, but it's like, it's such a gift because then you can be so much more present with your children. You know, if you could do that or you can 
you know, barter help, or if you have relatives, like whatever it is, get support. I I so, so agree with that. And sometimes it might be just jumping, like taking a step for a couple hours, get, get a couple hours of help and see how that, how it's that investment. It's really the return on the investment that I always find that that support comes back in a big way. It just enables me to do more. It enables the space to open up. So I've really found for me, that's critical to my balance. I love that. I think that's really true. We can't do it all. And, you know, the time we do spend with our families, you know, if we can spend it the way we want being present with our kids, instead of, you know, doing things we don't want, it just makes a big difference. Absolutely. What would you tell your younger self today? I love this question. It's like a a tender thought because I have a lot of compassion for my younger self, especially the me that was in my twenties, who was so lost and so afraid and didn't know what to do. So then I was in that advertising world and I was in a world that, you know, in a job that didn't feel right to me. And what I would tell my younger self was to be brave, quit, like just step into the unknown, be open and and let things, you know, I know you were so afraid. I know you're afraid younger self, but if you'll have some courage and not try to feel so stuck in the quicksand because of fear, but take a step out there and try some things, try new jobs. And if you don't like it, you can move like feeling that flexibility in life and try a lot of things. Love it. Do it all just all right. Love it. What would the 98 year old Kim Holstein (laughs) tell her today? The 98 happy, healthy Kim Holstein tell you today. (laughs) I I hope so. Yeah, we all hope so. (laughs) I love the idea of growing old and hopefully just thriving and learning and experiencing the beauty of being alive. My 98 year old self, what would she tell me today? What comes to me is time passes quickly. I mean, it really, you know, my kids were babies yesterday and my 98 self, she might say, Hey, I I know that I was your age just yesterday. So breathe into every day, breathe in intention and keep a perspective of what's, what's important and find what makes your heart sing, what brings you joy, what brings you purpose, do more of that, do that and enjoy the journey because it can feel quite short. Yes. Yeah. How would you say, because I so believe following your joy leads to purpose. And I think sometimes so many people, I know for a long time, I felt this way that purpose was so heavy. I was like, oh my God, like, what's my purpose? That's like, it's just, it felt overwhelming. And then you just forget about it. (laughs) or It's like, I can't do it. But I really so passionately believe that if you follow your joy in small ways, you find purpose. What would you say to that? Well, I, wow, I love that. I mean, I think that when we follow what makes our heart sing, what we're enjoying, what is joy to us, I feel like that guides us to our purpose. And sometimes I believe it can be very simple. It doesn't have to be big, um, but it all adds up. And yeah, sometimes the joy of walking my little doodle I mean, it's just so fun. It makes me so happy out in the neighborhood with the trees. And like, just, I realize it's that simple experience and and the joy of of these pups and their whole, you know. Yes, well, they can teach us so much about life, but I couldn't agree more. It's just like, you don't have to have one purpose. You could have, you know, many. I mean, I talk about my passion for paddle tennis. I love it. And I... I find purpose because it forces me to be present. (laughs) Right. So it's like, gosh, if I can find more things that help me be present, 
that's very purposeful because I apply it to being with people or being with my children. So See, but I, I love that. I love that because the more we do that brings us joy and the more present we are, then we're in these moments that add up so that when I'm 98 and I'm looking back, I know that I'll say, wow, that was an incredible ride. And it was packed with some wonderful adventures and learnings about life and a lot of heartfelt moments. Like I really rose to the occasion to be present. And that is my biggest, my biggest wish. And for my kids, I try to, I want to teach them, you know, be present in, in your fullest self. Cause I think that's what, you know, then we can feel we're really here to experience this, these years. Right. I love it. So I asked Sherry Lead, who's the friendship expert, what would you want on your headstone? (laughs) <laughs> That's just a great question. What would I want on my headstone? Well, right now, our mission in our juice business is as elevate spirits. And it, mm. it started out with cocktails. And then when COVID hit, I really felt called. I was like, this is about elevating the spirits of people. And I realized I was like, this is so much like in my truth of all I, I love to elevate spirits of others and be in that elevating energy. So I don't know, there's something about that. I love that. That that feels really part of me. It's like, if I can elevate spirits and, and I don't know, I'm going to think about that question. It's It's a beautiful, it's a work in progress. (laughs) Well, we all are elevating spirits. I love it. That's, that's so good. Something of that nature. Well, is there anything else you'd like to share with our listeners? I love this conversation. I mean, it really is. It's, I love talking to you. I feel like we could talk for hours. Um, I know you and I are going to do a program one day. We're going to figure that out. I would love that. There is such an energy in connecting with like-minded people. as we all, you know, learn about how can we really step into the alchemy of us and be a force. And I think that, you know, I see you doing that. And I mentioned when I saw you, it's like, how cool that you created this podcast and you're having these conversations. I mean, I just, I love it. I want to do more of that. You know, it's just, yeah, it's just way cool to be here. (laughs) So thank you. That's all. I just, appreciate being a part of the conversation. Uh, well, you are so inspiring and your multiple careers have been so inspiring and your energy is so beautiful. So it's been my honor and the listener's honor for sure. Um, Thank you. Yes. Tell us every, all where we can find you and I'll put it in the show notes as well, but Twisted yeah. Alchemy and, and anything else you want to share, please go ahead and tell us You bet. Well, with Twisted Alchemy, I mean, we do these, we do the cocktail kits and then we also bring groups together and we craft cocktails where we'll come up with themes and with the mission, I call it a toast of inspiration. So it's Mm -hmm. really bringing purpose to actually a cocktail and a toast, which I feel like a toast really is setting an intention to celebrate. And so there's a lot of magic um, in the experience. And that's where we're having so much fun with all of that. So that's twistedalchemy.com. Then you can also find me anytime, you know, on LinkedIn, Instagram, me personally, also Twisted Alchemy, but I'm doing more of the work with being a dream doula and helping others realize their dreams. As I shared, I'm just passionate about that transition and lifting others to move from that perhaps the quicksand or the paralysis or the fear, and then moving through to feel the joy when you can create like your wildest dreams. I love it. Beautiful. Well, thank you, Kim. This was so beautiful. I can't wait for our listeners to hear this. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy, so much. I really enjoyed talking to you. This was wonderful. Me too.